Dear colleague, dear companion, welcome to this uh, TNT sponsor session sponsored by Edouard Life Science, entitled Redutavi and Patient Pathway Optimization, Lifetime Management Decision Today for Challenges of the Future. So my name is Thomas Cuissé. I'm very happy to do this session with my friend uh, Thomas Modine, and we have a, a great panel of Discussant and speaker with us, we have Mirvat, Francesco, Gemma, Janar, Richard, and Giuseppe. So this session will be divided in two parts. The first one will be on benchmark and aim to provide an update on the latest results of the benchmark registry which have been presented in the LBT session during this meeting. And the second one will be more practical and will address the challenge we will fi face in the coming years about the Redu Tavi. And during this session, we'll see a recorded case from Padua, from Giuseppe and his, and his team. And accordingly, the, the learning objective and what we'll try to achieve together during this session is to first understand how the result of benchmark registry can be connected to long-term monitoring, increase quality of life, and reduce risk for the patients, to reflect about future challenges after TAVI in patients with longer life expectancy, and to be prepared to assess feasibility of redo TAVI and understand what is important to define the best treatment strategy. So without further introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Francesco, who will speak to us about the latest result of the benchmark registry. Please, Francesco. Thank you very, mu <coughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is uh, really a distinct privilege for me to uh, present on uh, behalf of all the investigators uh, the results of the benchmark registry that have been presented yesterday at the late breaking clinical trial session. But still, these are important results that are worth uh, re reviewing and discussing together because there are several uh, uh, topics uh, that may be important to uh, uh, optimize our clinical practice. So uh, what is the background of the benchmark? Indications for TAVI are expanding. We now have strong evidence uh, uh, that uh, uh, was reflected in the guidelines to uh, extend the TAVI indications to younger uh, and lower risk patients. So uh, this uh, uh, puts us uh, in front of several challenges. We need to increase uh, uh, our capacity uh, of all healthcare systems to provide uh, TAVI in a timely uh, matter. And we know uh, from several observations that uh, uh, there are important disparities between countries and even within countries between different centers uh, in terms of uh, uh, capacity to provide TAVI in a timely matter. And we also have evidence from the FAST TAVI and 3M studies that uh, streamlining TAVI may be uh, uh, feasible and it is uh, uh, associated with excellent procedural results and safety uh, is uncompromised. And uh, at the end, uh, this uh, uh, helps to reduce uh, hospitalization and costs. So with this background, the hypothesis was that establishing a standardized process by implementation of uh, some uh, uh, benchmark best practices will help to reduce uh, resource utilization, intensive care unit by occupancy and length of hospital staying. So the idea was to extend the, ex the experience of 3M and FASTAVI to uh, a larger number of centers uh, uh, and uh, uh, over, over all Europe. There is a, uh, you know, my pleasure to uh, present Dirk Frank and Gemma that uh, were co-PI of the study. I'm part of the steering committee. Uh, seven European countries participated with the 28 centers, so it's really representative of the Europe uh, re uh, reality. So the design of the study, the study was uh, non-interventional, multi-center, international, uh, in patients undergoing transfemoral TAVI, of course. And the, the, uh, we aim to compare 
patients enrolled in a prospective phase uh, with patients uh, treated at the same centers with TAVI uh, uh, in the previous phase. In the middle, there were two months of implementation of eight uh, uh, optimization uh, practices uh, for benchmarks. So during this phase, there was a, a, a continuous interaction and peer-to-peer -peer interaction between the proctors and the center and mentoring during this, uh, this phase in order to implement these best practices. Uh, these practices are summarized. They encompass all the phases of TAVI, so from the pre-procedural planning, uh, but education of the patient and the family, education and alignment of the internal team for pre-procedural, intra-procedural, and post-procedural phases. Then uh, in terms of procedural optimization, eco-guided puncture, and, and you know, a proper management of access site, we try to anticipate based on pre-procedural risk stratification the date of discharge of the patient. Early mobilization, very important. We aimed at mobilizing all patients at six hours. Decision three used to determine the need for new permanent pacemaker. Uh, this is a, was a, an important limiting factor for early discharge in the, the several experiences. Daily visit a contact between the treating physicians and the patients and the rest of the team and cr criteria based discharge. The primary objectives as, as I mentioned, was to reduce the length of hospital stay. We measured uh, all, uh, let's say, uh, uh, overall timing of hospitalization, but also door to TAVI and TAVI to door. Uh, and then mm, the second primary objective was to reduce the need for intensive care unit or CCU capacity. A secondary objective, we evaluated the quality of life in, of patients. We evaluated the satisfaction of patients and the staff. Uh, we evaluated how these uh, best practices were implemented in practice. Uh, and we aimed a, a streamlined diagnostic and reduce overall timing, needed procedural time in hospital post-TAVI care, reduce the costs of uh, human resources and costs. And, and uh, at the top of all of that, we need to ascertain that this was uh, uh, achieved without compromising patient safety. So what were the essential results in terms of characteristics? The two groups, so prior to benchmark around uh, 800 patients, post benchmark 1,500 patients, you see that, uh, I mean, the, the, the baseline characteristics were well, well balanced. We are still with patients around eight years of age, five uh, STS score. So, uh, in terms of characteristics, uh, in baseline ECG also, you know, no, no significant difference. Baseline echocardiography, very uh, tiny differences between groups, but not uh, statistical significance. So the, the groups were well, uh, well balanced. Uh, there were important differences in terms of procedural. You can see that the procedural was actually optimized in terms of uh, reducing the need of uh, uh, all anesthesia logic procedures, so from general anesthesia that was absolutely marginal, but most of the centers moved toward uh, uh, conscious sedation, from conscious sedation also to local anesthesia, no sedation at all, and procedural time was significantly reduced as, as well as interventional uh, time overall and the time spent in the recovery room that was shortened by half. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, technical success, there were no significant differences. So both uh, in both phases, the centers achieved excellent uh, success around above 99%. And in terms of periprocedural complications, there were no significant differences. The only significant one was the reduction of uh, the need for permanent pacing. Uh, what was the results, the primary objective? We, uh, uh, overall, we observed a reduction of our hospitalization of two days, uh, meaning 25% reduction uh, of the hospitalization of the patient. And when we split this uh, in terms of the ward where the patient was admitted, we also observed a re significant reduction in the time spent in this ICU, CCU, and intermediate care unit. So uh, all of that, uh, as I said, should be tested against safety, and safety at 30 days was absolutely uncompromised. You can see no difference between the prior to benchmark and the benchmark phase in terms of uh, 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 major uh, complications uh, 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 of TAVI, mortality, stroke, TIA, life-threatening bleeding, and so on. So we uh, uh, implemented in most of the center, uh, you can see very well the eight uh, uh, procedures, the best practices, important early mobilization. I would like to put an emphasis on this 
and this decision three about pay, uh, permanent pacemaker uh, implantation, so uh, uh, management of conduction disturbances and criteria-based discharge, among all the others. So uh, the three key results of the benchmark registry are that, uh, are that length of stay was reduced by 25% after the implementation of the benchmark practices. Uh, the need for ICU capacity was importantly reduced after implementation of these practices, and the implementation of these practices did not compromise patient safety both at discharge and at 30 days. And I would like also to conclude by uh, thanking all the participating centers and investigators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco. I think it's really important results showing that we can make everything easier, uh, the process, the hospital stay of the patient without compromising efficacy and safety. And maybe, uh, Thomas, we, we want also to highlight the fact that with the app, you can send us your question, comment, and we will address that uh, as, much, uh, as much as possible. Uh, I don't know if we have already a question here, but I would like maybe to start asking you, Francesco, in the benchmark, meaning the one... 1,400 patients, what was the pro proportion of patients who just skip the ICU? Meaning that they were just in the cat lab, maybe one or two hours in the recovery room, and then sent directly back to the world. Yeah, the, the design of the study was uh, basically that uh, all, all the patients could skip the ICU unless they had a complication. So that was the, and the, the, um, the idea was to keep all these patients with intensive monitoring for two hours, possibly in the recovery room. Uh, and most of the patients did actually achieve that. I don't have the precise number, but uh, you can see, you could see that because, of course, uh, all patients that needed to, to stay on, per, on uh, uh, temporary pacing, because the idea was to remove the, the pacemaker as soon as possible, possibly in the cath lab. But, you know, some patients develop some conduction disturbances, and those patients had to go to the, the, the intensive care unit. But overall, the reduction of the time was uh, uh, significant. So it's uh, about, on average, 14 hours less. And there was even less pacemaker during the benchmark part, significantly less compared to the... Yes, there was a, there was a reduction of pacemaker, and, uh, yeah... It's done up. So, Francesco, fabulous results. This way. Not yet. Yes. Oh, so, fabulous results. Um, you know, obviously, the aim is for safe early discharge. I wonder if you could just give us some insights into, obviously, Europe has some heterogeneity with regards to reimbursement. So, how does the reimbursements across different regions impact length of stay and potentially the registry results? Yeah, uh, Europe is a complex uh, <laughs> uh, situation because, you know, the centers and, uh, and uh, countries have different regulations, as, as you pointed out. We know, for example, that in Germany, just to mention one country, uh, they uh, get uh, less reimbursement if they don't keep the patient uh, long enough in the hospital for more than three days. Uh, so uh, this certainly impacted the results, uh, but this gives us also the opportunity and to further improve uh, our, the results of our register. So I think that today's reduction is still very strong, but I think that we can also further work on that, and this is why Benchmark will go on uh, by certifying and you know, collaborating with much more centers beyond this experience. Yes, we have, Francesco, we have a question here. Yes, please. Thank you for sharing this data and congrats for the brilliant presentation. My question is about uh, one in my clinical practice uh, causes of uh, prolongation of the hospitalization that is the minor and major, uh, major vascular complication and also the potential drop of hemoglobin before and after the procedure. Do you have data about this aspect? I mean, there are, there are no data here now reported at the moment that there will be, but uh, uh, as I said, there was no significant difference between the groups. Of course, you know, the idea of benchmark is not to uh, move everything fast, it's to optimize everything, so to uh, uh, avoid any unnecessary measure. But everything that is necessary, I mean, if a patient has a drop in blood, uh, in hemoglobin, or is a, uh, has a complications, there is no more hurry to, you know, uh, uh, because we don't want to compromise safety, that is very important. So keep it safe and the clinical judgment uh, will, is not changed uh, in comparison with the previous phase. So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe, Mirva, just a question. We've seen that uh, benchmark was combination of 
optimization of screening, simplification of the procedure in your practice. What was in the last, let's say, few months or a year, the main things which really change and make the whole process easier? I'm glad you asked that. We just presented in our local meeting um, our data where we looked at minimalism in TAVR including anesthesia. So we've long gone are the days where you're doing general anesthesia, TEE and, and all of and cut downs and so on. We've streamlined the procedure, we've streamlined the um, evaluation. So the patient comes and gets everything as a day surgery, um, all the workup that's necessary. The heart team discussion no longer needs to be a physical discussion. This is something we can pass around even electronically and everybody can say their input in patients that don't have question marks. Right. So the ones with without an issue of height of the annual, you know, the uh, shallow as, uh, sinuses or uh, height to the left main ostia. And, and then in the procedure itself, um, you know, using monitored anesthesia care instead of GA. And we found very similar results where the turnover in the cath lab, that's another metric that we don't often talk about, was much faster. Use of vasopressors because you're no longer using G GA also came, came down. And so the patients are less hypotensive leaving your cath lab, less requirement for ICU. So our ICU stays actually also come down and early discharge. Caveat to early discharge in our patients has always been need for pacemakers. So we still need to streamline that, I would say. Yeah, I think we have all the same practice. And the main thing, leaving the patient in the hospital longer, it's the conduction of abnormalities. Maybe Richard, also on, on, on the same point, uh, what really changed the flow of your, of your practice regarding the procedure, the screening, and uh, following the benchmark result we've just seen? Well, I mean, I think the benchmark data is really helpful for all of us, because even if you, we have a, quite a minimalist pathway, there are, there are small marginal gains that you can pick up through the benchmarking process. It doesn't, it, you know, it can be procedural, can be small things like doses of um, uh, protein at the end of the case, different changes in that. That has an impact of where the patient goes. So, for example, our patients used to go always to CCU. Now they don't. They just go to a simple ward bed for, the, for most uncomplicated patients. And I think really importantly, in a in a time uh, and resource pressed system that we have in the UK under the NHS, we can get more cases done per day. And that impacts upon our waiting times, which is a real uh, bone of contention for us. So, this, so the benchmark registry really helps us, I think. We're going through this process at the moment, but w we still think it's very well worth doing because there are, for example, the decision tree for pacemaker, for example, does address that issue that is, is problematic for us all in terms of early discharge. Yeah. 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 Giuseppe, may, may, maybe co coming on that, that we say that we optimize, we can do more patients. Uh, did you see a strong impact on, on your waiting list? And also, what, what are the main issues of the, of the wait, long waiting list we might have in some centers? Thank you, Thomas. I think this is an important aspect. So when you optimize the process, always you reduce the time, and actually, for sure, you will have more room to get some more patients in. But for me, what is important in my experience has been the crosstalk between the people that perform the procedure in the lab, that is the minimalistic approach that Mirva said, and the one that will discharge the patients, that many times is not the same person. So actually what you have to do is to put together these two different people and to streamline having a protocol in place that permits this crosstalk is all about you know, an early discharge. Because if you have this disconnection, you can do also the local anesthesia instead of, you know, the intubation. But the point is that who is going to discharge the patient? So having this connection is very important because you cannot say, I perform the procedure, I will follow up the patient, I will do the monitoring, I will discharge the patients. Well, because you have to work in team, and to work in team, you have protocol in place. And this is, I think, the major step forward of this protocol. And do you think the operator should discharge the patient yes. himself to make it more effective? That's uh, no, no, I'm not saying also. that I would like to... Yes, probably you will do the, like that, but actually, but actually, <laughs> this is your point. No, I think, <laughs> at least I think the operator should be involved in the decision. I think if you do the TAVI yourself, yes, and after you think it will be decided sure, yeah. in the world by non-interventional cardiologists, exactly, we are always problem. a little yeah. bit more reluctant because they think, wow, he had a TAVI yesterday, I will keep the patient for a few days. So I think you, we have to be involved into the, the decision yes, exactly. of discharging the patient, probably. Yeah, Thomas, I think we have questions. We have a 
an online question, and then if we have time, I will ask another one to Francisco. Of course, we, if have, we, have, we time. have time. So, Nicola Yerovante, I don't know if it's, I pronounced it very well, but you do, you, do, you, do you all reserve heparin, reverse heparin at the end of the case? And if it's the case, what is your protocol for protamine? Francisco. There was not a standard protocol in benchmark. Uh, the, the suggestion was to reverse whenever possible. But once again, the, one of the nice part of the, the benchmark that uh, people appreciated most is that you can tailor based on, you know, also a little bit based on local practice. Uh, there are operators that uh, were reversing always. There are operators that they don't like to reverse all heparin. The suggestion was to do it, and most of the, uh, the, the centers did it. Uh, and my Personal protocol is to reverse uh, uh, 80% of protamine at immediately at the end of the procedure, unless there are some issues or I had to implant a stent as a protection. But that's an important point. And we had also a randomized study from Germany which has said the benefit of protamine or not, and also suggesting exactly what you say, that giving protamine might lower the, the risk of, of bleeding complication. Difficult question for you, Thomas, uh, before moving to the talk from Gemma. So we say that with Benchmark, we will do more patient we will shorten the waiting list, so we will increase the possibility of each center to do TAVI. So do you think it might be the optimization could also be an argument driving the decision to open or not the non-surgical center? <laughs> <laughs> Said from a surgeon. Th this was not in the Sorry? script, so this is a trap. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, this is this is the yeah, we friend like that. What you know, we call you're, you're a fake school with the Thomas Quisse, so <laughs> he always hides something for you. Um, I mean, we cannot open centers without cardiac surgeons if we are not able to reproduce this and generalize this. I mean, there is no one that can say we cannot allow have it to be done in non-surgical centers if these results are reproducible. So the question is, are they reproducible? And what has led us to here? I mean, the, one of the important components is the choice of the device that you are using for this. I mean, we, let's not hide behind it. All the studies that are supporting this minimalistic yeah. and short of stay are driven by one device. So, so it's more a matter say, of quality than centers. Without e exactly. I mean, even 1% one, 1 of complication is too much, and especially we're going to, toward younger patients. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to prove that this is going to be safe for everybody, I will vote for okay. I, I wanted to yeah. follow up on your Tom, comment, because you, know, you hear these conversations about non-surgical centers and do we need the heart team. You know, I feel very, very strongly that you know, we do need the heart team. The success of this procedure was based on the multidisciplinary approach, right? Working together. And yes, the procedure is going through, but our decision making for appropriateness and lifetime management is getting more complex. So to disconnect the heart team, I think is the wrong approach. Yeah. So, Jadar, yeah. this is exactly the point. We have the results. Mm -hmm. They are perfect. But what has led to the results is even more important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there is confusion between the procedure itself, which is indeed much simpler than what we used to do many years ago. And probably it can be done just the procedure itself in non-surgical center. But it's the whole process of indication, screening the patient, thinking already about Redutavi, we'll see with Giuseppe. I think that's where the art team is even more important than during the procedure itself. Yes, me right and after we just a very quick follow up on the heart team. I think the heart team needs to evolve as well. So again, long gone are the days where everybody has to be sitting in one room and the meetings are scheduled at certain times when you can bring the interventional cardiologists and the surgeons out of the lab and the OR and everybody has to be in one room and twice a week and you keep patient decisions lingering for that long. That has evolved to where you can either streamline it and have um, a miniature team or even e-health, right? So there's telehealth where this information can be shared and um, electronically and decision making is still made. It's still difficult. Yeah. But I think that also needs to evolve and streamline. So can I say something? Yes, maybe after we move very, to the, please, Giuseppe. It's very short. Actually, you anticipated my comments. The art team needs to be evolved, and actually, I think also the time of intervention the art team needs to be evolved. It is not just for pre procedural planning, but as Thomas, you said before, actually, also at the time of the discharge, there is, is needed to have an agreement to say we are supposed 
as a team to say that the patient is free to go home. And this is very important because actually their team now is just leave us interaction between me and Modine to say, you, what, what, what do you want to do? You know, it's got to think it this way. Nice. That's a nice one. That's a nice <laughs> team. So I think we, to, to go a little bit deeper into the benchmark result, I would like to ask uh, Gemma to, to give us also latest uh, data regarding quality of life, working hours, and uh, increase capacity data. Please, Just Jeff. one word. We will try to answer all the questions coming on the, on the computer, but uh, we have a long session anyway to go. Sorry, Gemma. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to share this with you today. Thank you also to Dr. Sia for the wonderful presentation on the benchmark registry data. So I just wanted to recap a little bit about um, some of that data, but focus particularly on what it means for our service, for us as clinicians, and also for the patient. This is my conflict. So we've already heard about the primary objectives, focusing on reducing hospital length of stay and reducing the need for um, critical care for the patient after the procedure. And both of those, as we've discussed, are driven by increasing patient numbers and issues with capacity. It's also got this wider secondary objectives, focusing on streamlining the diagnostics, reducing staff workload, improving quality of life for patients, and also thinking about their levels of satisfaction along with staff satisfaction. Also focuses on improved implementation of these um, benchmark best practices, which we've been hearing so much about all the while without compromising patient safety. And I know we've talked about these bench eight benchmark best practices, but I just wanted to revisit them because I think what's interesting about this is it does adopt that whole pathway approach. This means it doesn't take just one single member of the team to implement these best practices. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say that at least five out of these eight best practices could be implemented quite easily by, for example, nurses within their current capacity. And so moving on to the results, we've already seen um, this slide, but I think what speaks to me most when I look at this is the rate of implementation of these best practices across every single um, measure. And this demonstrates an ease of implementation, which is really important to us in cl as clinicians. We um, know change is difficult and um, we don't want any barriers to that. So if these are measures that we can implement readily, then this is useful. Focusing also just on two that speak to me as a nurse, the education of patient and family and early mobilisation. They're two things that can be implemented readily within centres and driven by good nursing practice, yet prior to um, the registry, only half or a quarter of patients were having this experience. Um, and yet post-benchmark, post, um, it became a standard of care for the majority of centres. This slide also talks, um, reflects a little bit about the workload. I mentioned that it doesn't need to be one person driving through these changes. I think this um, really demonstrates a multidisciplinary approach to patient care where we can see that the time spent with the patient is shared reasonably um, equally between the various clinicians. So we talked a little bit about staff satisfaction and that's something that the registry looked at. We asked physicians, nurses and by that we mean nurses on the ward or in the cath lab and also the TAVI coordinator or TAVI program nurse as well and ask them about their levels of satisfaction with things like implementing these quality of care measures, their workload, bed capacity, improved communication and overall teamwork and we could see across the board here that you know the majority of team members were were satisfied with that process. Equally we asked them about their satisfaction in terms of how they felt the measures were implemented and we saw a good demonstration that the staff were satisfied with how they had been able to implement these measures. Just to touch briefly on the role of the TAVI coordinator or TAVI program nurse, this isn't a new role, it's something which has been adopted fairly readily across the UK and in America in nearly all of the TAVI programs. We know across Europe that the uptake is slower, yet there's lots of evidence and documentation to suggest the vital um, role of this person within the TAVI pathway. And again, that's something we looked at. We looked at the sort of regular touch points um, where there was a coordinator working within the team and where they um, had contact with that patient and what their impression was on that 
patient. And so um, we can see the coordinator was involved with the heart team meetings. They met the patient, they described the process, they addressed their concerns. They helped with waiting time management. They saw the patient when they were in hospital and prepared them for their discharge, as well as thinking about the ongoing follow-up and having input into some of the logistics that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, like juggling bed occupancy or trying to streamline and schedule some of the diagnostic workup. And again, I think this fits quite nicely with the eight benchmark best practices in that the coordinator follows from um, referral all the way through to treatment, much like um, the best practices of a whole pathway approach. This person is a constant in that pathway. And so it's really as a result of this that we're able to see these results, um, you know, the, the, the ease of implementation of these best practices and the engagement of the staff. And that's fine for us and for our service, but what about the patient? Well, we saw also um, good levels of satisfaction across the board from our patients with this program. They felt that they were actively involved in their treatment decisions. They enjoyed the explanations of doctors or other healthcare professionals. They felt that their family were also informed and prepared, and they felt that the interactions they had with the team were respectful. Importantly, they also felt prepared for their discharge, and I think that is important when we're talking about shortening hospital length of stay, that patients must feel confident and prepared and ready to go home. Um, particularly, um, you know, that has an impact on things like readmission to hospital as well. And also just um, to touch on quality of life. So yes, you know, we put the valve in, but that isn't the end of the story. What we want is for our patients to realize the benefit of that treatment. And what we saw here is that from baseline to discharge, the patients did report an improvement in their quality of life. But this was also realized in following discharge in the 30 day um, follow up, that they continue to build upon that benefit and reap the rewards of a successful TAVI procedure. So just to summarise, we do know that there is significant variation within our clinical pathways for patients undergoing TAVI in Europe. We now have this large registry conducted across multiple European sites, describing how we can implement eight tailored benchmark practices into our hospital routine, and we can do that within a short time frame. And this helps us to um, reduce the length of stay without impacting the patient's safety. The patients and the staff report high levels of satisfaction with this program and we can implement it easily. So I think this really helps us to really drive forward this, um, this program as TAVI is becoming more widely adopted and um, we can see cost savings um, but we can also see benefits for our patients as well. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. I think it's, it's also very reassuring to see that on top on safety and shorter hospital stay, the patient and the family enjoy it at the end. I think that's also an important part of our, our mission is also to make the experience of the patient better. Uh, as Tavi, maybe before addressing the question, Thomas, uh, as Tavi coordinator, what will be maybe for people who want to implement the benchmark uh, recommendation for next week in their Tavi program, what will be your very simple advices? For example, one that you state, I think it's very important, is to prepare the patient because sometimes you aim for early discharge and just the day after Tavi, you go to see the patient, you say everything is fine, you can go home and he say, no, 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 I had vas valvular surgery, I need to stay at least one week in the hospital. So what will be your practical advices for the patient? Yeah, so um, it is very much about engaging the patient early on, involving the family as well, because sometimes we have a situation where patients feel ready to go home and it's the family that are saying, yeah. no, absolutely not. So making sure that the, they are all involved in that discussion early, setting some expectations. Um, this is what is going to be your expected standard of care um, during your hospital stay. And this is when we would expect you to go home. I think some of that is about identifying barriers to discharge early on as well because there will be patients that do have barriers to discharge and helping them in advance of the procedure work through some of those um, but also it is about really adopting your nursing team engaging them in um, helping deliver care for the patients like I say a lot of these principles can be easily implemented by nurses within their capacity and um, it's about encouraging them and motivating them to take this forward and see the benefits. 
Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thomas, question uh, from... First of all, congratulations for this. This is really important. Uh, I can only uh, highlight the importance of a TAVI coordinator. We have one which we started working for us a year ago, and our life changed. <laughs> and really, it's, it's very effective because it's at the interface between what's happening in the CAT lab or the OR and, uh, and the nurses. And one of the satisfaction of the nurses comes from this information, which is continuous between uh, these two parts of our jobs. Um, also, as a surgeon, I mean, I can convince easily my patient that replacement is better. So my question is, would you give the choice to the patient or immediately tell him, we're going to discharge you tomorrow, and I tell you why it's better? So my question is, if tomorrow I have a patient and randomly ask him, we can discharge you tomorrow, but you may stay one week, what do you prefer? What do you think they would say? <laughs> I think it depends on who has spoken to them yeah. in advance. Th that's what I'm saying. So yeah, the information, yeah. the way you deliver it is very important. But yeah. that means we have to that's train right. our patients. Okay. Yeah. That's, you, make, you made a good yeah. point there, though, It's because well. of you. They want to stay yeah. longer yeah. in Bordeaux. Yeah. Huh? If but she uh, likes you, uh, In my actually, hospital, uh, they enjoy you know, being yes, each other. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to seduce them. I mean, this uh, is yes. part of my, my how they say. When you talk to the patient, there is always this room. That's what they come That's what they come for. Just to expand on that, though, because you did make a good point there, is, you know, I could go and see the patient at the end of the day and say everything's looking great and we expect you to be able to go home tomorrow if the consultant then comes along and says hmm, maybe we'll get you home on day two they're not going to listen to what the first answer yeah, was exactly. they're, they're going to take so there's very much a team message approach as well exactly. everyone has to be delivering that same communication Thomas, no, do we have questions? Yeah, we have many please. questions. Yeah, I don't so know how to Maybe let's select. address one or maybe two before moving to the second part of the, of the session, please, Thomas. A technical question, actually, that could lead to a discharge or not. What was the decision for new pacemaker implant, center-specific, in the benchmark, or it was uh, left to the decision of the center? Uh, the decision tree was, uh, uh, I mean, we had a common uh, decision three, but um, based on that, uh, we needed to discuss with the center some uh, specific uh, uh, difficulties. For example, in some centers, there were the electrophysiologists very much involved in the decision making. Uh, and when they are involved immediately in the evaluation going out from the decision tree, it's always more time or more uh, need for pacemaker. So for example, in patients with left bundle branch block, uh, um, many electrophysiologists tend to, to be cautious, but we in our decision tree, it was not like that, and we did not see any problem. Yeah, that's the main difference so between the, the center. Yeah. It's a left bundle branch block. If it's AV block, it's pace. If it's normal, there. But left bundle yeah. branch, there is very different practices. So we provided the general yeah. tree, but then it could be a little bit adopted. Adopted. To, to but I think what would be important for the future probably is the profile of patients who have been immediately skipping the, the ICR and the others who stayed where we changed the decision. So the question. Uh, one question from Jens. He's asking, what do you do with the neurological complications that could occur Richard. after 24 hours? Richard, do you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a tricky one. Um, <laughs> Where is <laughs> Jens? <laughs> Online, I think. Right. Obviously, if you've discharged them, you won't be able to pick this up. And so I think this is where the pre-discussion with the, the family and the patient is crucial because if, if the patient has an expectation of how they will feel as they've had this discussion with the patient on day one in terms of how does the top of their leg feel day two, to whether there's any confusion and so that the family can be pre-warned that they may need to bring the patient back if there is a if there's a, 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 a perhaps a latent neurological sequelae that wasn't quite identified before the discharge so actually getting the family's confidence and the patient's confidence is really helpful so that's why the early uh, early discussion is really important but i think w one thing that really struck me out of this was the um staff satisfaction mm. yeah, too. and post pandemic that's really important because mm. i think lots of countries in the eu have struggled in maintaining and keeping their cath lab mm. staff and uh, improving you know, the whole staff experience is really important to have in a really good yeah. functioning service and a good streamlined service, certainly for TAVI. Yeah. And just, I mean, the question on urological complications is very important because 
occurs. of GTIs occurs in the first 48 but hours. It's mm. the same for the late conduction abnormalities. Sure. But still, it can happen, but we cannot keep all the patients for you know, a few events. So patient information and the family as well. But this so is just very shortly, it's important to point out that uh, uh, one of the prerequisites mm. for very early discharge is to have uh, some family assistance. I mean, yeah, if course. a patient lives alone, then it's better to keep maybe 48 24 hours yeah. in the hospital. Yeah, thank you. So I think it was a, a great uh, first part of the session, and I'm sure that the benchmark uh, study that Edwards performed, thanks to many of our colleagues, I think will be really landmark evidence to support the optimization of the of the TRADI process, and I've sh that will be interesting also to meet next year at Europe year, but also before to see how this finding will be implemented into, into people's practice. So just to set the stage and before moving to the case presentation of, the, of Giuseppe, we'd like, Gianna, just to, to say a few words on the, let's say, the Redutavi concept. No, thank, you, thank you so much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here between the two Thomas or Tomases, whichever is culturally appropriate. So I'm the... Uh, He's the real one. He's the right. real <laughs> so I'm just setting the appetizer a little bit for my good friend Giuseppe, who's going to go through a case. but. So this is our current indications, and we talked about how we do TAVRI. We do things differently. We treat patients differently, depending on what region you're in, what country you're in. And you know, I think that really needs to change. But as you can see, that generally where we don't argue is elderly patients. And so how does that affect redo TAVRI? Well, we're not doing a lot of redo TAVRI right now, right? The, the current experience in the room, even among experts in the field, people doing 1,000 TAVIs a year, is still small. Uh, so we have to learn as a community how to do this safely, effectively over people's lifetime. You can see 0.5% from uh, the TVT registry in 2021. Uri Landis's registry was 0.22% of total cases. But this will be a problem, and this is the slide that I think has really convinced me. This is US data, of course, it is not representative of the rest of the world, certainly not of Canada, and I'm sure of much of Europe, but this is where the field is going. So this is by age group, data presented at TCT, 280,000 patients or so. You can see that in 2021 in the US, almost 100% of patients got TAVR in this age group. Between 65 and 80, where we sometimes have a debate in our center, you can see there was a projectile increase up to 87% of all patients. What was staggering to me is that in the under 65 age group, 50% of patients in 2021 received a TAVR. This is severe isolated TAVR. That was AS, sorry. So these patients are going to come back. And also, more importantly, what we're seeing in our center, as I'm sure you're all seeing in yours, is patients are asking for a minimally invasive procedure. And patient choice will become more important. If you leave a valve long enough, even one that our good friend Thomas has put in, <laughs> it will degenerate if somebody lives long enough, whether it's a surgical valve or a, a transcatheter trans valve. You have different options. We can talk about the merits of surgery. Early reports have shown that explant is not necessarily straightforward and high risk. I will say, though, that this is early experience, very high risk. Techniques will improve, and I think potentially that will also be an option for patients. But redo TAVI when somebody has had a minimally invasive option is attractive. Um, but it may not be feasible in all patients because what you see in URI series and other series is successful cases. We have become very good from treating failed surgical valves and identifying coronary obstruction. And we know that a proportion of cases from CT studies would not be feasible for redo TAVI. We have tried to understand on the bench some technical implications and differences between uh, redo TAVI and Saverins. There's some things to consider. Neoskirt height, which we're all familiar with, is when the leaflets of the first valve, which are degenerated, get pushed up. In a surgical valve, that's very similar. And that neoskirt basically may prevent obstruction of flow to the coronaries. But in a transcatheter valve, there's many different designs, and that height can vary very dramatically and sometimes be prohibitive for many patients, particularly if you have a tall frame valve. The other thing that's different about TAVI valves is that we implant it at different depths, and it's really the proportion of the skirt that is above the annular plane that is important, and so this all factors into risk planning. There's a unique phenomenon in redo TAVI of leaflet overhang, which we demonstrated in this paper, which is just showing that if you put a short frame valve inside a tall frame evolute, you get the overhanging leaflets of the failed valve. 
We have to understand what the implications of this are. How much is acceptable? Is any acceptable? And then the other piece of it is that we're talking about valve fracture in the surgical space, but you can also expand the index TAVI. And each combination is completely different. And the degree of expansion varies between whether you're treating an evolute, whether you're treating a sapien, whether you're treating an accurate. Uh, and so all of these are very tailored. And then there's some even more unique phenomenons, such as in this case with the accurate valve, which is a tall frame valve, but with an incomplete frame. This is the edge of the valve. And you can see that there's actually a little gap that gives you a little bit of gain of VTC. So the edge of the sapien does not extend all the way out. So you actually have a little bit of a safety margin with this valve, may be useful in some cases. But all to say this was all just a little teaser on multiple different concepts. Really pre-procedural planning is the key. And you know, my friends Giuseppe and Rado put together this procedural document just on things to think about, which is a nice systematic approach. And I'm sure we'll discuss that in the case to come. Thank you. <clears throat> Super. Thank you, Jana. I think after this beautiful teaser, as you said, I think we can, we can move to clinical practice and uh, to, yeah, to see the... Amuse bush for Giuseppe. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice one. Here I cannot speak French, so I cannot say amuse bush. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. So, thank you. Um, dear colleagues, now we move from the bench of Francesco to the bed, so to the patients, let's say. So this is a case of THV in THV. 88 at the time of the, of the admission, late 2022. But actually the story is native, tricuspid aortic valve stenosis in 2016, dyspne near three, severe aortic stenosis, 45 millimeter of mercury or gradient, and less than one the area at the level of the aorta, no CAD, and the heart team decided at that time, 2016, transfemoral TAVR accurate neo medium. 82 years old at that time had the patients. This is the index scan at that time. So the mean diameter is, you know, let's say 21, and the area was 20, 21 by 25, the area is 421. The height of the coronary is pretty much reassuring. And actually here you see that the ilio, iliofemoral axis is quite clear, so no major problem. So at that time we went uh, with the implantation of the accurate knee. There is some, you know, minor leakage. By transthoracic echo, the echocardiographer said that it, this was a mild PVL. At least he thought like that. Then we'll see if it is like that. And uh, the gradient was normal because it was four millimeter of mercury. What's happened next? Pardon. Six years later. Hospital admission because of pulmonary edema. The ECG, the patient had tachycardia, some secondary alteration of, let's say, of the ST segments. There was a clear stretch of the generation. This was the reason, the main reason of biprosthesis failure, with uh, the main mechanism that was intraprocedure, intraprosthetic regurgitation. Because of the prolacion or coronary leaflets, so actually it was not a mild leak, uh, at the, or probably it was there, but actually the, the new reason of rehospitalization was the intra, intra intraprosthetic regurgitation, as you can see here by transesophageal echo. There is a clear deviation with, you know, it was intraannular, intravalvular regurgitation. And this is the cut at that time. It is clear that the regurgitation is severe. The coronary artery were clear. We had to make some consideration about the position of the coronary compared to the height of the valve, the risk plane, as Janar said before, but actually it's going to be in a short while for the next part of the session. And now what's next? <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks like Thomas Modin, so I think we can. We can. <laughs> you, you, you know what? Have you noticed he started giving his talk? Look at my seat. It went down, you know? No, but He's disturbing. No, I think it, it's a beautiful case. It's a beautiful case of the, of the challenge we have more and more in practice. So I would like to ask, uh, to ask Thomas to have a, a deeper analysis of the CT and what we should really look at on the CT before planning a, a, a redo TAVI. 
Of course, I'm, 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 of course I'm, I'm doing I'm, do, I'm doing a min minimalistic presentation. Otherwise, he will render me very minimalistic. <laughs> so, <laughs> we need to stay please stop me. Well. Yeah, yeah. Please, please stay close to me. <laughs> I, I want this. <laughs> so, so there are very important features uh, that are very, very important in the pre-screening and the analysis. Well, I use Tremensho to to analyze the city that uh, Giuseppe sent to me. One of the slides that General has been showing is the accurate. The accurate leaflets are higher, which helps the valve achieving longer coaptation, which is also favoring uh, the low gradient in, in, in the small anatomy patients. However, we know that having longer leaflets if you stretch them, if you want to do a valve and valve, this could, could bring the leaflets against the coronary arteries. But this is not all, because the shape of the sinuses is also very important. And as has Janar showed very nicely, you have this gap in the design of the valve itself that could uh, offer uh, a gate to escape this, uh, this uh, coronary complications. I mean, coronary complications for me is if you want to move forward to younger patients, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges. Pacemaker, you can implant it or not. You, you, can, you, can, you have time to diagnose it and treatment, but you have a coronary occlusion, it's difficult. And if patients are referred from far away centers, it is even more difficult. We are used, we know these valves, but I think the average interventional cardiologist who doesn't implant, that could be much more difficult for him. So. Um, you have to uh, memorize some, some wordings which are important now. The neo skirt. Neo skirt, that means the skirt that you're going to produce or create when you're going to add the new treatment with the new device. So, also, the, this would depend on the, on the new device you're going to implant, either if you're implanting self expandable or balloon expandable. I'll show you the numbers, and this will stimulate probably later the discussion after the the presentation of, of uh, Giuseppe. Neo skirt, calculated, it's very important. Here we calculate it to be 11. I don't know if Giuseppe had the same number. Uh, the reproducibility of the, 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 the measurements are important. The leaflet overhang is also a term that is very important. This is the old leaflet, how it does uh, behave once it is completely in, in, uh, in inflated or uh, pushed against the aortic wall by the new device. V2C valve to uh, coronaries is also important, and the projection of this. You can see these are horizontal cuts. And you can see that the, the, the crown of this valve is, shows you that the coronary is, is, uh, is patent. But actually, this is a false security. By looking on, only on this, I show you the arrow. It's injected, you have a good flow in it. But it doesn't mean that necessarily that once you implant the valve, it's going to be a straightforward case. Commercial alignment, I mean, personally, I use commercial alignment even for balloon expandable devices. Mm. I think it's very important the, for the coronary access, but also for uh, the, the, the flow, I would say, rendering the flow very uh, physiological. And commercial alignment increases the chances of being able to. Uh, go into the coronary osteas for any uh, cardiologist who's not necessarily aware of the, of the device. So we can also dis discuss about this later. And the way you look at the coronary is based on your commercial alignment, the way if you are the right sinus, the left sinus, or the, uh, it changes the measurements that you can make. Quickly, you can, this is how for this patient, uh, I know Giuseppe will show you this, how we could achieve the commercial alignment. And these are one of the best standards of practices that we have to observe also technically if we want to do and jump into redo tower. I think the number of redo tower increase not only because by necessity, but also by mastering the technique itself. This is very, very important. And this is something we have to learn. It's not putting a valve and then going, going out. I will finish by this. Um, these slides have been given to me by my, my colleague, Benjamin Segui, who is a proctor for a company called Picardia. And it, it shows you clearly that in some patients that I'm we, we simulated the, the S3 within an evolute valve that has been degenerated, but it could have been the same 
in a bicuspid valve or it, has, it have been the same in a surgical valve. Some surgical valve like uh, the mitro flow, for example, also, are implanted supraannulary with the long leaflets like the accurate and could in increase the, number, the rate of coronary. The reason why uh, it, is, it is important is this. If you don't achieve a detachment of the leaflets, get them away from the coronary ostia, this is what will lead the, to the occlusion of the valves. This is a very uh, nice comic to show you here. Quickly, this is the case we did. Uh, I didn't choose to show you basilica because I wanted to show you something which is very important in the future. We have to be able to be reproducible, really, really importantly, in terms of eliminating the risk of the coronary occlusion. So nothing special here. I will go straight forward for this. I know uh, Thomas is be becoming nervous, very nervous. No, 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 no. No, no, no. So this, this device is not CE mark. So ju but just to, to show you the importance, I'm going to go here. Otherwise, he would kill me. No, no, no I will I love you, I know that. <laughs> so we split the valve. This is very important. The quality of splitting the valve, the leaflet, is the key. If you split the valve in the middle of the leaflet, which is immediately um, facing the coronary artery, this is what gives you the security to implant your valve afterward, afterwards. Otherwise, this is at high risk. So I think Redo Tower also will increase in the future because we will be able also to open really and safely the coronary osteos. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Maybe we will check if there is a question in the room. I just checked that nobody is as the... Maybe, uh, Thomas, you, you told us that in some cases the risk of coronary obstruction is very high. Of course, we can discuss about chimney, basilica, or even short cut if it's available in your center. But in those cases, sometimes we cannot, just cannot do it. And I would like you to share with the room your experience for explantation, or TAVI, because we heard from Jana that it's not a, it's not a simple surgery. And uh, what is your view on that? No, it's not a difficult surgery. It is, as you have said, if you don't have experience, you don't know how to do it. It's like climbing for the first time a difficult mountain and the second time to be easier because you know where you're going, where you're driving through. The results show clearly that the mortality rate after redo surgery, uh, redo tower are high because the patient's population is, were also at very high risk. Yeah. We should not forget this. The second thing is, uh, uh, the, the, the risk score when we indicated the surgery was higher than the risk score when we, went, when we did the tower first. So this is very important. Now, technically, it's not difficult. I think it will be difficult when we explant in after 10 years because the... On the, the tetralization complete, and yes. the arctic roots exactly. treated as well. And in elderly patients. Yeah. So I just want to say one thing that he can ask me. If today, I prefer to implant a tower in a patient who's young. If it fails after 10 years, I still have a quality of tissue that could make my surgery easy. But I don't want to explant a tower at the age of 85. And maybe in a few years, the, let's say all the measures or techniques that we use for coronary protection, they will be more mature. We will have more exactly. than short cut basilica. And exactly. So. so I think we can come back to, to your case, my Giuseppe. Case. And meanwhile, we will just check with Thomas whether we have questions from, from the room. So actually, thank you. <clears throat> let's go back to the case. So actually, I would like to share with you a kind of stepwise approach. That was the one that Janard before mentioned. This belongs mainly to these consensus documents that include different experts in this field. And all is about standardization and objectivation of what we do to avoid major error in the final size positioning and uh, you know, choose of the second choice of the second valve. So as you can see here, there is something that you can print and use, uh, as Thomas said, sometimes next week in your lab. That is a full checklist of things that you can fill in before tackling this case that actually are not so frequent. So you have, as you can see here, four main pillars. The first one is the CT scan before the index study. That was the one that I showed you. Second point is the index THV matrix. So you need to know everything about the valve that you have implanted at the first intervention. And now you will see in the real case how it works. 
third is the mechanism of failure, because actually uh, this is a main uh, driver of the final position of the second valve. Because actually it is uh, really reasonable to think that when you have a stenosis, you cannot leave an overhanging. You need to tilt up the leaflets completely. On the way around, when you have a severe insufficiency without stenosis, actually you can save the coronary axis going with the second valve that is a little bit deeper. Then we have to discuss in long-term follow-up what means all this. And actually we will have a nice discussion on, on this point. And finally, we need to see the post index Tavi CT, uh, at CT scan because actually we don't put the surgical valve where we cut everything we, the, the, the valve is round is round shape in every case actually sometimes in many cases we have a symmetric disposition especially with the self-expandable valve and so on so pre-index Tavi I fill in for you uh, the, the, the checklist uh, with all the things all the number from Thomas Modin and actually I reported all the <laughs> things <laughs> and so this is the pre-index city I worked for you eh? thank you thank you <laughs> this is one for me so the second point is the index THV matrix and this is very important to know because actually when you say medium that means uh, 25 actually we are referring to the waste of the valve we are not referring to the inflow that is 3 plus 28 and we're not referring to the hooks where the valve is 30 millimeter so you need to know that this on the bench. THV failure mechanism, and here you can see that there is stenosis, no. Regurgitation, yes. Excluded prevalent PVL, yes, because it matters in terms of the final sizes. Thrombosis and endocarditis is no in this case. Fourth point, just to be very schematic, is to look at the valve on site. That means that we don't have any more 25, we don't have 28, but we have 24, 23. And we need to take into account this. And another point down here in yellow, this uh, crescent, uh, you know, half moon, is what uh, Modin showed you. That is, should we measure here the VTC? This is the right question. And actually also Janar presented very quickly. But what is the VTC? Is this the measure that we need to take? Pretty much the same of the surgical valve. I'll show you what is going to be the real VTC in a while. And actually, this is uh, something that already Janar have shown you. You need to know everything of each valve. And as you can see with the accurate, the leaflets uh, do not hit the frame. So that means that you have a gap, as Janar said before, between the maximum expansion of the leaflets and the frame. So we cannot measure the distance that we measure for surgical valve between the post and the aorta. Because actually, in this case, if we follow the surgical measurement, it means that our VTC is extremely low. But actually, this is not true, because the real VTA in this case is a little bit uh, you know, more forgiving, because you have a restriction in the movement of the leaflets. And this is an example on the bench when you have a valve that is 23, and you get in with a tube of 21, depending on the ascending aorta, this is a very crucial point, the width of the ascending aorta. Say if the ascending aorta is tight, actually you have one millimeter of extra space, but you have a a very large ascending aorta, let's say 26, actually you have 2.53 millimeter of extra space. So that means that uh, ideally we need to gather more cases, but actually you can go within the coronary from outside of the frame or between the frame and the leaflets if the valve is oriented. So in conclusion, going back to the case, so we have an extra space it is more forgiven as a VTC, so the final VTC is about, is, you know, reassuring. But you need to know that, uh, you know, we will see in a live in a box how it turns out, all this consideration. My last slide is just this one. <laughs> it, it, no, it's, you know, I, 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 no, because, because Thomas, you know, told me that you are a little bit nervous. So I don't want to get more nervous. But actually, the, the point is that we stay in the 2A, a, because that means that our case, in our case, the coronary ostia are below the wrist plane. 
as also Thomas showed you, but the VTA is forgiving, it's reassuring. And actually, THV, THV infeasible is feasible, mainly also because we have an aortic regurgitation. So, I think, I know, we need to start with the lavender yeah. box. Yes, <laughs> pardon. You see? It's, Don't be nervous, huh? it's okay. I'm not nervous. <laughs> I'm quite relaxed, believe me. So actually, this is the access. What I used to do is the echo guided, but I like to give just a shot of floor, huh? because I want to be sure to not puncture too high and to go, you know, uh, above the groin. So I think it's just, you know, a little floor, huh? and do, you will understand where you are. But this is something that I handsome. prefer. So then, yes, uh, because, um, you know, otherwise you need to know all the tricks of echocardiography is going to be a little bit a long story. But at this point I'll go with the two with a stitch based suture and this is two proglides you know everything about that pardon me if I show you this part but we need to be very didactic and uh, we go with the Y and here I want to like you to see the amount of regurgitation it is really <coughs> severe and I will stop in a few seconds just to show you the way I cross the valve. I don't use the straight wire. I will go with a pig tail. I will open a little bit, a little bit the tail, and you will go automatically in when you have a severe regurgitation. I can stop here if you want. Yeah. Giuseppe, you mean you go with the pig tail to avoid going behind one of the stabilization arches? This is the step forward. I will answer now. No, this is the point. This is the point. Actually, in this case, we don't have PVL. But actually, what's the risk is that you go from outside to inside. Exactly what's happened with the left main, yeah. just to understand. So we need to be sure about that. So you have two options. One is, uh, you know, it's something that is nice for the slide, but I don't follow to rotate the tube and to look at this. But actually, I don't like this way. The way I like the most is the following, that you stay with the pigtail and you push here in the cusp overlap view. I will show you again. When you push the pigtail in the cusp overlap view, you push against the stabilization arch. And when you see these outward movements, this means that you stay exactly in the, in the middle of the valve. So this is a very important trick. The other way around is another way is to go with the balloon and to see if it is stuck when you go through. You want to say something, yeah, I Jana? Just, I was just going to say, um, the one other thing is that one Kim described as well, that with the push, you also pull, because if you line up your two posts, two, one, if you're yes. through one of the stabilization arches and you pull inner, you won't be able to do that if, yes. you've, if you've gone through a stabilization arch. So push and sometimes pull is helpful. Giuseppe, in some cases, the type of degenerations might not allow to cross with the pigtail. So probably in some cases, we have to be even more careful for the next step, because we will have to cross with straight wire yes. on platz left one, exactly true. as we do for ear. This yes. is true, yes. So, and then we have to be probably. But when you cross like this with ear, I think usually yes. Yes. normally you should be. Yes, please, again. Speak aloud, please. Uh, no, but the microphone is Thank not you. working. Huh? Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Perfect presentation. I just want to share this experience that happened to me that I consider funny. <clears throat> I challenge all of you to know how much is the length of the commissural high of a 29 millimeter core valve. Why I say this? Because I had to treat a degenerated 29 millimeter core valve, and nobody, neither the person who works with the Medtronic, can say me how perfectly was this high, because there was a well, C professional is... secret. So my um, recommendation is now to collect all the data of the available device now, because we will face yeah, okay, a degeneration yeah. of this device in 10 years when we were using other device. So it will be very, very difficult to, uh, to know the precise uh, me measure. And I think it's really important because but what I understand is that this procedure is really, really tailored. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I think, I think as you know, Jana published, I think, uh, 25 bench paper on the different <laughs> design and the redo savvy. So probably you can, you can answer, no, I think. No one, that. no one will let me do anything else. So, um, I, I think that's a really good point, which, you know, Thomas Modine mentioned, which is that, you know, particularly for repeat procedures, 
the importance of commissure alignment of the first valve is so crucial. So, you know, if you don't have that in place, it can limit the success, but you are correct, all that data needs to be available. Sure. Yes, too, but if I can give you a recommendation, uh, you don't need to call Medtronic. <laughs> if you go in the supplemental appendix of the operative manual that we have published, you have every single size, every single valve with all the details. This is just to facilitate your life. In your intervention, <laughs> yeah, it's true. But the, interestingly, the, the concept of the commissural alignment arrived a few years ago. So probably if we start doing Redutavi for Evolit, which has been implanted eight, ten years ago, mm -hmm. I think we were much less careful about the fact to do commissural alignment for the first THV device. Absolutely. But and also we, in this case, it was just luck because yeah. it was oriented we much, it was play of chance. Huh? Because actually, in, tw in, 20, 20, in 2016, uh, we didn't have Janar, you know, with the bench <laughs> test. <laughs> yeah. so. Thomas, do we have questions from the room? We have a question from Radoslav, he's here. Uh, Radek. Is he? Hey, Radek. So I will read for you. Uh, how do you define VTC when, first, you have a leaflet overlap, which you know is modifiable? Yeah. And I have a second part of the question. Do you want to answer this? How do you define VTC? I mean, you, you have been alluding to this. But more precisely, yes, the, what is the more best More precisely, way? Is it, de it depends on the devices, because actually you cannot apply this algorithm for the other one. For instance, the Navitor hit the, le the leaflets, hit the struts. So you can, theoretically, you don't have an extra space. So it depends. We need to know more about that. And we need to start from the bench test, as Janara have done so far. But actually, then we need to see how it turns out in prospective registry that actually we have yeah. No, one ongoing. Yeah, Otherwise, one. without clinical data, I think it's very difficult to. Actually, yeah, I think the, I think the crucial thing about Tabby and Tabby, and the more of them you do, the more you realise how important that first implant was. Yes. Yeah, how good it was or wasn't, and 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 I think it's important how implant depth has changed over time. So that's certainly been the case with certain self-expanding valves. Yes. Uh, 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 a trend to go to zero or one implant is storing up an enormous amount of trouble for us down the line when we have to treat these patients with TAVI and TAVI because the neoskirt will take us right above the, the, and sequestrate the sinuses. So the, these are really important issues of how the whole technology is evolving, how are we implanting these. And the right, you really should speak to as you know, you're obviously masters, but most of us on putting in a lot of Tavi and Tavi at the moment. And so sharing expertise is really important if we're going to get these Tavi and Tavi cases done properly and well for patients. Th thank you for this comment. And actually, I think for all of you, uh, our proposal is just to go in a stepwise approach without disregarding anything. So filling in all these variables is important because it's a way to learn how to standardize the things and apply to speak the same language. Otherwise, it's very difficult. It's like bicuspid valves. Sometimes I used to attend, you know, meeting where they just measure the annulus, taking no care of about the RAFI. This is strange to me in 2023. So we need to speak the same language. And to speak the same language, we need to be simple, as simple as possible, but not simpler. So we need to follow some rules, and then we have to see in perspective the clinical data. But if we start, you know, messing up with what we measure, what we we don't measure and things and to <clears throat> take decision in the lab i think this is not the way to go i mean there's and another thing for leaflet modification that rado mentioned that so jaffer khan showed this very nice bench demonstration about the potential difference with laceration mm. when you have different types of thv valves and because i have to be careful i don't do anything offensive but <laughs> if you have the v and you and you have a short frame valve the coronary will be up here, mm -hmm. and so the splay is much higher. If you have a supraannular valve, you're going to be up here, and so the point of actually what's providing you flow is actually a very tiny split, and so that's the argument for what why they recommend doing a balloon-assisted basilica for those to cases make it larger, yeah. to make that point high. The high unicorn. High. So, but actually, we need to take care also <clears throat> uh, on top of the split of the leaflets about the cell width because actually, if the cell width is very short, go with another valve. You create an overlap, even though you 
get rid completely of the leaflets, actually you better have, you know, any way difficulties to get through the valve. So staying below is important. Mm -hmm. And Giuseppe, maybe last question on the CT. It took years for us to learn about uh, nat CT natica, nativa is, and then we'll have to learn for the Redutavi. But just speaking about the relationship between a VTC, which can be reassuring, but then after when you do balloon expandable for the Redutavi, we will do over expansion of the index THV device, and we might also slightly modify the VTC. And this is a perfect point for the second part of the lightning box. <laughs> so you are, you know, you're perfect. you anticipate everything. Did you see? Yes. Did you see? Yeah. So maybe coming back to your life, one technical question, it's about cerebral embolic protection. We had... I don't use cerebral, um, cerebral vascular protection in this kind of procedure because to be honest, uh, you know, it's not my normal practice. Okay. I can say, you know, by the data, by non-data, etc. But actually, you know, the data, not to reassure me, but actually, let me think that when the risk profile of the patient, surgical risk profile of the patient is very low, the risk of stroke is below 1%. But those patients were not part, of course, of the yes. protectiver. But, yes. uh, but exactly. maybe if we do basilica or shortcut, do you do it when you do no, complex do like it. shortcut? I mean, I, we, we really look a lot you, you at did. the shape of the leaflets oh, themselves. I mean, the, 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 the comic you've shown with a lot of calcifications, exuberant ones, may deserve especially that the crossing of the valve sometimes is difficult, may deserve cerebral protection. And some others where the leaflets are covered by on the tedium, they are very smooth, they don't need, we don't do it, I mean, oh, for every case patient. By case, yes, I exactly. Say case, do it. But, but actually it's very difficult to isolate a guidance also in yeah. a case by case. Yeah, uh, yeah no, sure, sure. But, uh, to be honest, you know, also the mechanism of the generation of the valve is different. But it's you also difficult to generate uh, enough yes. data to support it's, it's this. Yeah, in this case, there is no material. I think it's pure air. Exactly. So, but if yes. it's you don't have to manipulate too much. Yeah. Yes, exactly. agree. You had one more yeah, comment. Just, yeah, just a question. If you do see halt on the, on the, on the pre-procedure CT scan on your TAVI, does that change your approach for the cerebral protection? If you make what? If you what? see some uh, hi, hi, ah. hyper hyper attenuation on the leaflets because um, sometimes we see that. This is another important point. Actually, I don't know, you know, instinctively I would say yes, we change, but actually mm. it turns out, uh, you know, by data we don't have data. You know, and sometimes yeah. we, we expect to have disaster and we don't have anything. So yeah. this is what puzzles This is going to be driven by uh -huh. eventual data that we could collect. If mm. we see that we have more stroke in the future by doing this, we will have to use cerebral protection. Yeah. If not, we will not use it. That's it. Data. That's yeah. why a registry, exactly. like the one ongoing yeah. that we will discuss later, this is very important. It's really key, now, I think. Yes, because you have to think too many things. Also, what is structure of the generation when you have THV and THV? Are the VAR3 definition, you know, reliable or not for the second valve? So everything needs to be known. But probably next year, That's why we have to in combine. the PCR again, we will meet again with all of you. And okay. present the <laughs> they will never invite us again. I'm because so far they, they will could, never yeah. invite us again after this <laughs> performance. Okay, let's go. Uh, go ahead. Please. Okay, so... We used in this case Sapien 3 because actually in Europe, um, it, this is the only THV valve approved uh, according to the CMARC for THV and THV. And this is the simulation of 26 valve. This is the general recommendation uh, in our um, you know, operative guidance. And generally speaking, actually, the sizing is mainly based to have a little bit of oversize, but in this case, you know, the valve is a little bit constrained. But if you look at the native annulus, it was perfectly a 26. So this is very important as a guide. Second point is the positioning. The positioning is highly dependent on the mechanism of the structure of the generation. When you have an insufficiency, you don't have at least for the safety of, of patients uh, during the index procedure, you know that you can go lower, you don't need to tilt up and displace completely the leaflets. You can leave some kind of overhanging. Grant the fact that we don't know if this should m modify the therapy and what is going to be the long-term follow-up. Actually, in summary, having three sizing, positioning, very low, accepting, uh, let's say, 40% or overhanging in this case. Ah, uh, one second. I went for coronary protection because uh, even though we make all this assumption, uh, for me, the patient is first, exactly as you said before. When you go with a second valve with explantation, you might have surprise, and we are dealing with the patient, so I prefer to go anyway for coronary protection, left-hand side. 
So let's start with the live in a box. I went into the coronary just to show that when the valve is oriented, it's not much of an issue. We went with a wire in. And this is an interesting trick that I would like to show you. If you push the wire and you have, you know, this kind of displacement of the catheter and you try to cannulate again, you don't have to push because if you push against the commissure, you will lose everything. So what you have to do is just to retrieve everything to realign, pulling the wire, exactly what we do for the coronary intervention, then to change the axis and to get in. Not to push against resistance. This is very important because you can, you know, stop against, uh, you know, the commissure. Then we went for, the, let's say, a protective stance. Um, this is the situation. We have the safari wire in place. And look now, it's, we introduced the, the sheath, remove the, uh, le, the dilator, and we went, you know, uploading the valve. You know everything about that. At this point, we've already uploaded the valve and we go to make the arch. This is another critical point if we want to go step by step. You need to change the angle with the knob of the commander, respecting the fact that you don't need to hit the stabilization arch. Otherwise, you bend them, you might bend one of them, and it's going to be a mess because sometimes you might have, I'll show you now in a while, when you go in like that and you go too deep, and you have a little gap here, you can anchor the stabilization arch. So you, you don't have to do like that. You need to be very careful and to change the angle to stay in the middle of the valve. At this point, our target is the outflow of the accurate that had a good position at the index implantation to stay a little bit above and you know, below the mid portion of the commissure. It is where the leaflets are stitched. So you now you will see the pacing and the inflation of the valve okay pacing on i push a little bit no the valve feel like being in a cat lab huh? <laughs> the pacing. yes yes because i'm you Put know some gravity i'm such stick, type you know? of guy i'm not <laughs> just okay but anyway this is the valve in valve you know, frame in frame, leaving out the proximal parts of the um, commissure. And now I'll show you another trick. At least this trick is for me the trick. And so the point is the following. You make an angel and it seems to be reassuring. Look at this. And the real question is, should I go with the stent or not after this angel? So there are different versions here. There are guys that's want to know something more with the eye or other things. What I do, I don't know if you... Do you think we can ask, but I'm yes. a member of the panel, know what you did, but <laughs> Richard, what, no, what, they what know you all what do? I did, you know. Yeah, I think you shared the, the recorded case. Yeah, these are, these, these are very tricky. And, yes, um, but I don't use these, uh, these, I mean, my, my manner of coronary protection is, is a chimney stenting, which, you know, I find is, you know, is, is very reproducible, but in this case, I probably wouldn't have done it up front. Uh, I'm interested to know what Giuseppe does about his uh, stent sizing, because, of course, uh, you can do it from the CT scan. But in an ideal world, you do it via, via IVUS in terms of what you're going to put in the left main. And these are some of the, the downsides of using coronary protection, particularly uh, chimney stenting. And we don't really know at the present time what's going to be our antiplatelet strategy, for example, how long that should continue. And, and um, a whole manner of potential embolic issues a bit in the longer term for this. I have a question from my side. Uh, in this case, you could accept a little bit more overhang. I mean, do, do you think that uh, a little bit lower implantation could, I mean, uh, be safer from the coronary perspective and from the overall results of the procedure? Uh, no, yes, but you need to trade off, at least in my experience. The, in this case, you don't have this problem because the patient has already pacemaker there, but actually you will increase significantly the pacemaker rate when you go very low and you overexpand the patient's high pressure. Exactly. But actually, I have one question for the audience. Right at the end, who would have stent this left main with this angio there? Right at the end, who don't? Okay. The vast Giuseppe, majority don't. The patient could die because of coronary occlusion. He will not die because of a pacemaker. Yes. 
agree with you, yeah. but actually the overhang, uh, how much is, according to you, Janard, the rate of the, the amount of overhanging here compared to stay two millimeters below? Yeah, and yeah. so so Absolutely. it just as a general concept, you know the depending on the two positions you look at, which is at the base of the stabilization or just at the top of the <clears throat> upper crown, the rate of leaflet overhang treating inaccurate is less than that with an evolute. Yes. Um, and overall, yeah, the lower you go, you will have more overhang, but it is not as much as what you would see with an evolute. That being said, look, most of our stuff has shown in new valves that overhang is okay. Is that really good? I don't think mm -hmm. so. There's nothing... I mean, Toma, you open up a chest, you don't see overhanging leaflets yeah. biologically. So <laughs> it is a compromise that we I deal with anything. that maybe is okay for somebody that is 85, 90. But if somebody is 65, is that something we know the long-term implications yeah. for? No. So, I mean, what you have said, there's an important wording. It is uh, a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Trade-off pacemaker, trade-off paravival leak also, and trade-off coronary occlusion. So yes. the decision is not easy, and it should be taken patient by patient. I have and what we don't it's know also, it's what, what to do with leaflet overhang. Meaning, if you have a exactly. lot, should we change also the anti-thrombotic strategy because exactly. we might have more Who material? Knows? So exactly. We, exactly. we don't know yet. So we need prospective. So I have a question. Can so, we? Yes, please. Yes. So Hazem Al Gindi is asking you: upper crown is not covered, <laughs> so why don't you just pull on the catheter? Do an angio and evaluate. This is probably what you did. For me, it's outflow to outflow. I don't see this kind of mismatch. So actually, this is, I think, quite reassuring what happened so far. My suggestion was to remove, I think, the jet skin's guiding yes. uh, to assess if the left vein is still open. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'll tell you. I'll tell so you. So please. I'll show you. I'm a simple man, so actually, you know, <laughs> let's. <laughs> So and so, but actually, I'm, uh, so the, 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 the things that I've done in this case is the following that actually I removed the catheter, I went back with the catheter, and actually I tried to engage and it was really smooth. I didn't feel any resistance. So that means that the MLA is at least 2.5. So I was reassured to get out. Everything. And for this chimney, you took a, a much shorter stand compared yes. to what we used to do huh, with Evolute when you take uh, 28 at least to. To be Agree. above the leaflets. Here you can see the final angio. Have you seen the final angio? Final angio is really, I think, mm. very good because we don't have even a, a single, yes, red blood cell that goes through. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, when we make a pullback here, we don't see, we didn't see any gradient also. Even there is no pressure recovery. At this point, what we do is just to make an angio to see that the distal part of the vessel is okay. This is the final angio. Mm. You can see that everything seems to be okay. I'm beginning to understand why your left hand has no hair now. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> all the <that> radiation. <laughs> Gives no, no, but it's just to, avoid, just to be sure, and then I will remove it. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, this is my last slide. Is the CT scan after Redu Tavre? Actually, I don't see any clue for pinwheeling, but actually, what is interesting, you can see the overhanging in the top of this slide. As you can see, there's, there is still a restricted movement of the leaflets compared to the post of the valve. So, a question why I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Why overhanging is an important matter? But the overhanging is an important for me. It's a rescue mechanism. So if, <laughs> the point is, otherwise, when you have this kind of overhanging, this means that you're supposed to permit to have an overhanging because you don't have a gradient. We don't know anything about stroke risk. We don't know anything the about the further risk to having not only a, further steno a future stenosis, but also, also to have an impairment in the stolic feeling because they may compete, yeah, exactly. you know, in closing, you know, the, the valve, durability. the valve closure. But actually, what is reassuring to me that what is going on in, in terms of startup, etc., is leaflets, laceration leaflets. And actually, in this case, you can split the overhanging or remove the leaflets mm, mm. without having a cardiogenic shock because the second valve is working there. Well, it's opposite when you try to tear the leaflets without any parachute. And durability in this case, you have a parachute. Also, durability can be in pure. Maybe bad. last short question and short answer. It's, uh, would you assess hemodynamics 
always after redo TAVI, and in case we have what we can observe for valve in valve, 15, 20, or even more gradient, would you consider cracking the index TAVI as we could do? Difficult. Again, no, again, I think uh, I, I would check, I check every case of THV in THV, likewise by gas speed valve, to be honest, and all is small annually, because uh, sometimes you have surprises. What about cracking? It depends on the first valve, because with the Lotus, for instance, it's strongly, it's strongly not recommended by IFU, because you can still yeah. disconnect the buckle and the post. So uh, we say, uh, uh, Maybe you for know, the in, in gym there was a case where they pre-delayed, post-delayed the Lotus and didn't happen, yeah. nothing, but actually it depends on the first valve, I think. Thank you, Giuseppe. Well, thank so you. Maybe one word just to, to summarize the nice session. So we had two parts. The first one was optimized today. It's about the benchmark registry. And the second one is about be prepared for tomorrow, uh, about the, the Redo TAVI, and uh, we can link both by the Redo TAVI registry, which is starting thanks to these guys and with the support of Edwards. So it's, uh, it's a good way to link the two topics we discussed uh, during the session. So I would like to thank this great panel, the speaker. <laughs> we, I think we, we discussed a lot with a very good atmosphere. That's also, I think, part of, of being here together. So thanks also for your input during the discussion. And uh, I wish you uh, a nice meeting. Enjoy your stay in Paris. Goodbye.